All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So you can probably see me glowing with pleasure. Today we have with us Dr. Tariq Alam from Bangladesh. Dr. Tariq Alam is a professor and head of department of internal medicine in Bangladesh Medical College or Associated Hospital. He is uh, he did medicine from uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Then he did his uh, boards here in the US as well. He is, I believe, board certified internal medicine and pulmonary medicine doctor. He's an MD and now he's practicing in uh, Bangladesh. However, the the importance of seeing and talking with him today is that after the Kelly study from Australia about ivermectin reducing the viral load, COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 load, Dr. Tariq Alam was one of the first who started using ivermectin with doxycycline and started managing patients successfully. I believe he is a pioneer from where the remaining world learned how to start using ivermectin-like things or figuring out are there solutions instead of just sitting at home and becoming blue and going to a hospital in a bad shape. So this is the personality which we have today. He is the personality who is responsible for starting this wave of early and aggressive treatment. Dr. Tariq Alam, uh, Professor Tariq Alam, welcome. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much. Uh, very good evening from Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, Professor Alam, tell us a little <clears throat> bit about your work, your COVID work. How are the how are your day to day uh, activities look like? Uh, thank you very much. COVID work is actually since last uh, April it started. Since I started using ivermectin and doxycycline. Before that, actually, it was as it was all over the world. <clears throat> Bangladesh was also using hydroxychloroquine and uh, azithromycin. But I think at the time, because of indiscriminate use, lots lots of people died because of cardiac problem in our government medical colleges. So at that time, one of my senior colleagues uh, who became positive, she was an oncologist, and she was referred to me that uh, for the treatment. So I had offered, as usual at the time, hydroxychloroquine and uh, azithromycin. But uh, then she said that I don't want. I'm elderly. I don't want to have azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine. So, and then I had just, as I had read about Kelly's study, I offered her uh, doxycycline and ivermectin, and she agreed. She agreed that I will take this medicine. So I was a little bit surprised when I gave her the medicine. That uh, that was a very minimum dose, <coughs> excuse me. Ivermectin for uh, one day, 12 milligrams, and uh, doxycycline for seven days. And boom, in seven days, she was negative, and she was finally again seeing patients. So that was the starting, actually, how it started. And then uh, after a month of uh, giving ivermectin to my students who had to go back to India, who was missing their plane, there was a visa problem and the staffs were getting positive. I came out on the media and then I actually published the paper also. And from then actually it has become a roller coaster ride. And I am on the phone most of the time actually giving prescription for patients who, am, who I am treating at home with ivermectin, doxycycline and a few other medicines. And uh, recently, after the second wave uh, in Bangladesh has started, it has really become busy. And uh, usually my day starts at seven o'clock and finishes around 12 in the night. Today, uh, uh, I have been, I've been lucky that I have been spared and that I could come and join you. But it, it, it is a very difficult times in Bangladesh now because we have scarcity of medicines. We have scarcity of uh, oxygen and uh, people are not coming to the hospital or to the doctors earlier. It, it is very difficult at this time. Got it. And one um, comment that you made a few minutes ago, which I think is before we start discussing about the prophylaxis and the acute disease and uh, long hauling <laughs> and vaccine and post vaccine, one important comment you made, which was very interesting for me was you said that early treatment is very important. So can you highlight for us over here? Our protocols are um, sitting here in the US. Many countries have this protocol. The protocol is that if you develop symptoms like COVID, isolate yourself, stay at home, uh, do symptomatic treatment. And if you become short of breath 
or start becoming blue in your face, then go to a hospital. Uh, can you tell me what is the right approach? What should happen? Uh, that is the, the same protocol is uh, followed in the national guidelines of Bangladesh uh, COVID committee. So like symptomatic fexofenadine and uh, Monte Lucas and paracetamol and stay home. And if you turn blue, then go to the hospital. It's the same here. But my approach has been aggressive from the time being because they say it's 80 percent will be asymptomatic and will be fine at but we don't know which 80 percent is going to be fine at the end of the seventh or eighth day so i as ivermectin is a very benign medication i have been using it from the beginning and doctor cycling is also a very cheap medication and it's also very benign until unless you have some gastritis problem so i've been giving patients ivermectin and doctor cycling at home from the beginning and alhamdulillah have, by the grace of god i have got good results 99% of my patients uh, get cured at home and the results are really good. So I think it's uh, the aggressiveness of the doctor should be the most important thing. Patients will say I have, uh, most of my patients say in Bangladesh say that I uh, got uh, wet in the rain and then I had uh, cleaned the house and there was a lot of dust and that's why I'm coughing. But now we know, I know at least that this is these are COVID symptoms, and I start treatment aggressively from from as soon as they call me, I ask them to start the treatment, and, and the results are really good. It's, it should be really aggressive. Don't wait. Got it. Thank you very much. So I think this is an important point. If the listeners, if you can take one thing away from this whole talk today, that is to to treat early and aggressively. Do not let the patient go down a place where they have so much damage that they end up in a hospital they would either become long haulers or they will have severe damage even to their life so early aggressive treatment is very very important so uh, professor alam if so this is the the way i structure the talks with uh, with our uh, esteemed guests so if i could start from prophylaxis then acute disease and then long hauling and and request how you are managing them so if you're OK, and for the cool beans, please hold on to your questions. Let me uh, ask these uh, for these areas, and then we would start entertaining some questions as well if Dr. Alam has time. So uh, Dr. Alam, first of all, how do you prophylax the patients? Uh, we did a study of prophylaxis in our medical college at the time, the small unit, COVID unit we had. And at the time, we were giving uh, ivermectin 12 milligrams once a month. And we did the study for four months, and out of 60 patients, uh, 60 persons who got ivermectin, only four got infected. And out of 60 who didn't take it, 34 got infected. So we, we published that paper. And after that, actually, I thought that as the half-life in the tissue is around 15 to 16 days, we should take it every 15 days. But since the last three months, as the Delta variant has spread across the subcontinent and Bangladesh is also on, uh, reeling under the pressure now. We have, I have given, I've been giving my patients it every 10 days. So 12 milligrams for adults, 18 years plus every 10 days, and who are uh, 5 to 12 years, I've given it 6 milligrams every 10 days, and 12 to 18 or 17, uh, 9 milligrams every 10 days. That's how it's going on, and it, it's working well. It's working well. But Very so good. Long. Very good to know. And, uh, and Dr. Alam, do the people who are on prophylaxis do they complain of any side effects and you have to change the doses or stop the drug what is the success i haven't had any oh, thanks sorry i haven't had any complaint of side effects till now uh, for ivermectin i haven't not a single complaint very good well, very good to know. and uh, in addition to the ivermectin do you do you ask them to keep their vitamin D levels better? Do you ask them for other advice from health, food? Uh, is there a is there more than ivermectin for prophylaxis? Look, uh, there was uh, there were a few few studies by the International Center for Diarrheal Diseases and Research in Bangladesh and one of the health authorities. And at that time, they did an antibody test that was six seven months back, and they found that the people who are uh, who are working in the factories, who are a little bit on the uh, downside, they had antibodies, IgG, uh, against COVID, and they didn't have symptoms. So I don't know whether diet is a big thing that 
provides protection against COVID. But most the, the thing that correlated with their immunity most likely was vitamin D because they work in the sun, walk in the sun. So, and people who are on the upper class people, they were not going out, they were staying home, so their vitamin D was low. So that was my notion. And I think a lot of people also think that vitamin D gives a lot of protection against COVID. So I also asked the patients if they can to take vitamin D 20,000 or 40,000 every two weeks. That, that's what I uh, prescribed to them also with the ivermectin. Got it. Got it. Thank you very much. And there's a question that is very interesting. Luis Grande says, sorry if I missed it, but how did you arrive at ivermectin initially? So I want to tell the story of how I found and of course, the professor should answer this as well. Uh, I think you'll, you'll, be, uh, you'll be amazed with this story. So I, I was looking at how the COVID management should be. This is the last year, February, March timeframe. And I looked at Kelly's study and I was fascinated with that. I remember I discussed it here as well. And then there was a, as I was searching for Kelly studies and ivermectins, Dr. Tariq Alam's uh, news started popping up. And so I became very curious and I started researching Dr. Alam. And I started seeing that all right, he's from Bangladesh Medical College. He's, so all those credentials. And I started seeing his work. And so I started following Dr. Alam. And from there, I found out that he started using ivermectin as well. And Luis Grande, he just mentioned that he actually started it by requesting one of his colleagues who was not well and asked her that if he could use ivermectin for her. And then from there, the rest is the story. The whole of the world is now using it. and that. Here is a pioneer who started that. So, uh, Dr. Alam, is this correct that you were um, you had looked at the Kelly study and then decided to start using it, or was there more to the decision? No, as I said in the beginning, the Kelly study was there certainly, but uh, the, there was a volunteer who wanted nothing. Uh, she didn't want azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine, which was popular at that time. So that was the only alternative I had in mind, and that's how it started. Very, very interesting. So uh, continuing on from prophylaxis towards the acute disease. For, so first question about the acute disease, the symptom set that you used to see last year versus what you see today, are they the same or there is a difference in symptom set? The symptom sets are almost same uh, in the Delta variant. But nowadays we see the diarrhea starting in Bangladesh and diarrhea, diarrhea starting on the fourth or fifth day. The diarrhea starts, and few patients are having uh, 100, 200, 3 degrees Fahrenheit temperature from the beginning. So this is something new, and also the smell goes away on the seventh day. A few patients I have been having lately, most likely because we have a lot of Delta variants now. Most likely it's the Delta variant that the smell goes away on the seventh or eighth day. This is something new. Otherwise, they're almost the same: the fever, cold, and cough. Got it. Eight. Got it. Got it. Thank you very much. So now for your patients who you can manage early on. So let's say if I am your patient, I arrive at your clinic, I am coughing. I think it is because I was dusting my home, as you said. How would you start my management? What would what is your protocol for acute COVID? Uh, that's an uh, easy question. Actually. So I think we we lost him. Uh, maybe his internet connection went down or computer. I can see him almost rejoining. So please hang tight with me. And while we are um, waiting for him to arrive back, his work, um, if you just look up Dr. Tariq Alam, I, I have to give a shout out to Samina, Dr. Samina Chaudhary as well. Dr. Samina Chaudhary is the one who. I'm sorry. Sorry, sir, we lost I'm you. Right. Yes, my sorry, apologies. Sorry, because my internet was not. Uh, actually, we sent them for a COVID test and asked them to isolate. And as soon as they have the COVID test done, I start them on ivermectin and doxycycline and uh, high, high dose of vitamin D. That's what I do. And then I wait. If the COVID test comes positive, we add, uh, we usually go for the D-dimer and the CRP and the ferritin. 
uh, with the CBC with the SR. And if it is not, we we'll continue the ivermectin, doxycycline, and the vitamin D for the next three days. If the patient is improving, fine. If it's not improving, then we go for an HRCT scan of the chest. And if the HRCT scan is uh, moderate to severe, then we admit the patient. But if it is mild, one to five percent, then we usually add. Uh, we add the rivaroxaban. We add rivaroxaban, two point five milligrams, one tablet twice a day, and usually send him home and ask him to do a repeat D dimer and CRP in three to four days, and keep on uh, communicating with me or whoever the doctor is. That's how we do it here. Very interesting. So you do start anti clotting. And is the anti-clotting for every age group who has reached a point of, uh, let's say, mild stage or uh, mild towards severe, or is this for some? For some, for some. And we start with a very lower dose, 2.5 milligrams. We don't give the full dose, 10 milligrams. Got because uh, and, and most of the patients, sorry. I'm sorry, uh, most of the patients, uh, most of the patients from my experience usually start having a high D-dimer on the seventh or eighth day. So let's just keep a step ahead. That's why that's what I've been doing for the last three, four Got months. it. And, and sir, you were saying that if we start the treatment early, the D dimers, the CRPs, they are in control. So you have the privilege of getting the labs more often because you are associated with the hospital. So comparing two patients, one who is not managed versus who is managed early, in the labs, what difference do you see? Uh, in terms of the three timers and CIPs, yes. If the patient is at home, uh, we if the patient is at home, it, it actually they 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 usually do a D dimer and CRP and call back, or they text me. That's with the previous reports, and uh, we I I don't see that much. If I start treatment early, the D dimer and CRP, I, we after doing a second repeat one, I usually don't have to do a third or fourth one. I, I just ask the patients to complete the course and forget my name. They can do whatever they want. So, and once I start the treatment early, I haven't seen that many long haulers in the last one and a half year. Okay, but I have seen a lot of patients. Most of my patients are, are treated on the phone because they don't come to the hospital. I treat on uh, on the phone by like telemedicine. But long haulers, only a few long haulers, uh, I have seen in Bangladesh. And the people actually who start having long COVID symptoms in the hospital or are very weak, that's the most important thing. They start saying, I'm feeling very weak. That gives a, that gives me a sign that they might be going for a long haul. Usually I give them something I don't know. I, I haven't heard anyone discussing it, but it really helps. I give, ask them to take red meat, red meat, beef or mutton, who have, who have two to three pieces every day for seven to 10 days. And that really helps and they get better quickly. And if they still have weakness, one medication, two medications I use that is levocarnitin, one tablet twice a day for 15 days and ginseng. Ginseng really helps one capsule once a day for a month. It really helps and brings the patient back. Well, I had never actually heard of these, you're correct. But this is so interesting because over here, when the long haul, somebody enters the long haul, it becomes a very long, uh, miserable situation and getting them back out is a difficult situation. They become very, um, of course, uh, unhappy. They are disabled almost from their day to day function. So it is great to know that you can identify that there is somebody who's going to become long hauler by seeing if they're becoming weaker or saying we are becoming weaker and you have these medicines as well. So, sir, uh, tell me this, folks with comorbidities, so let's say acute COVID with somebody who has diabetes or hypertension or cancers or uh, immunosuppressed, is there a management that is different for them or the same management works? I, I haven't changed anything, actually. I use the same medication for everyone. Uh, even if they have diabetes, try to make sure to control the diabetes. The Pressure is not a problem until I start. I have to start steroids. That should, that is not a problem. And immunosuppressed patients who are on uh, hydroxychloroquine or on cancer chemotherapy, they are they are a bit of a challenge certainly. But I haven't 
I haven't, uh, none of them actually died. Most of 99.9% uh, .9 patients went home early. None of them actually died. Very, very good to know. And um, once again, a shout out to Dr. Samina Chaudhary, who actually helped me connect with you. So Dr. Samina, thank you very much for your uh, help. There is a question that Dr. Samina Chaudhary asks every time, and that I think is an important one. And that is, how do you treat pregnant women and breastfeeding women? So is this some a cohort that you have been treating as well? Is there some advice from you that how we should treat a person who is a woman who is pregnant and has COVID? Usually pregnant women, uh, we don't, I don't give ivermectin. We don't use it here, even if, even if they are in uh, advanced pregnancy. I usually use uh, azithromycin, 500 milligrams uh, for seven days. And if the D-dimer is high, it's usually high in pregnant women. But if it is high, and we don't know for what cause it is high, it's the pregnancy or the COVID. I usually use aspirin. Aspirin is safe in pregnancy. And one dose of vitamin D, 40,000 or 20,000, whichever is okay for the age. So and, and that has given me good results. And breastfeeding women, if they can give formula feed, I give them ivermectin for five days and ask them to stop feeding for seven days. And if they cannot stop, then again, azithromycin uh, is the medication I give and if needed aspirin, that's it. Got it. Thank you very much. So before we move on to the long hauler, I want to entertain a few questions from the cool beans over here. So there is uh, Daniela Stanika says, are you also giving the patients corticosteroids? Yes, if it is needed. If they have a lot of cough, they are short of breath, and the uh, HRCT scan shows moderate to severe uh, lung involvement. Yes, I'm using corticosteroids, six milligrams dexamethasone once a day. Got it. Thank you. Uh, VS says, is iron for immune system support? So is, I is haven't... iron used as well? No, I don't use iron separately. Oh, perfect. Got it. One common question that I'm seeing here in the questions is that ivermectin is not everybody is convinced, not every doctor is convinced to give ivermectin. Uh, is that the situation there in Bangladesh as well, that there are some doctors who are convinced to do it and some who are not? There are a lot of doctors uh, who are convinced actually to use ivermectin, but they use uh, ivermectin in combination with remdesivir and some use in combination with favipiravir. They are using it. But ivermectin is there. It's not that they use remdesivir only, but there are a small proportion of doctors who don't want to listen uh, the name, hear the name of ivermectin. They use usually remdesivir or uh, nothing. That's how they do it. And they still maintain the notion that ivermectin is an antiparasitic medication. It doesn't have any role for a treatment for COVID. It, it's there. Got it, got it. But it was great to hear that there is, that is a smaller proportion. So there is a question uh, from Dr. Smith Kasari. He is a practicing physician, I believe, in Goa, has been helping um, COVID patients a lot. Very, very active doctor. So he's saying, when do you start steroids, if any? What CRP would you say is critical? When do you do HRCT? Do you start? So lots of questions. Do you start low steroid first, especially if fever persists beyond day five? So any comments on this question or okay. questions? Uh the indication for sir, I just told that uh, if the patient is uh, having a lot of cough, uh, the saturation is dropping and is short of breath, and the CT scan is showing uh, moderate to severe involvement, then I use steroids. CRP, um, uh, just uh, upper limit in Bangladesh is six, and if it is more than 25, we usually think that's uh, going to critical. But we have a lot. Most of the patients we see that they have CRPs more than uh, 34 to 35. That's more than that, and. Uh, CT scan actually, you know, Bangladesh is something very different from the rest of the world. Here you can, once you hear Mr. Trump say that hydroxychloroquine is the medication, you can empty the shops of hydroxychloroquine. So here, CT scan patients come and they do it by themselves to the, get, go to the laboratories. And actually, it turns out to be recently that patient comes to you with the CT scan. Okay, so. Most of the time that's there, but usually CT scan is done if the saturation starts dropping. That's when I do a CT scan, it drops less than 95 and there is increasing shortness of breath, then I do a CT scan. Otherwise, if it's more than 95, I don't do a CT scan. 
And if the patient fever persists more than uh, day five, then six milligrams, I think, is the dose I use. I, I don't use less than that. Got it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, continuing on, I'm going to ask this question. So Avinash Kinikar says, how long ivermectin prophylaxis can be used in children below 10 years? Once in 10 days for how long maximum? Uh, it's a difficult question, but we are using it for the last two months. So uh, what I have been saying that maybe the next two, three months or maybe another two months should be the time for the Delta variant to pass on. If it so another two months, I think maximum three to four months, we would use it for uh, every 10 days. Then I think I revert back to every 15 days. That should be fine. Got it. Thank you very much. And um, one more question from Kara Lady Bean. This liver carnitine and ginseng, please clarify further to help us choose good effective products. Does type or age of ginseng matter? Uh, the ginseng that we have in Bangladesh is usually comes from China. So there is uh, only one quality. The, we, are, we don't have the chance to choose. But maybe good ginseng would be better, certainly. I don't know about the red ginseng saying they might that might help. But what we have is the common ginseng that's, yeah. that's sold in Bangladesh, one of the pharmaceuticals. A few of the pharmaceuticals make it. So that that works well. So I don't think I I think better ginseng quality might help more. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, a question, this is a very common question. Uh, you mentioned that as well a few minutes ago. And McNeil Iser says, when and how was it discovered that ivermectin works with patients, COVID patients, I would assume? Is it all parasitic drug that seems to work with COVID? Uh, I don't know about that because I don't have the laboratory to test that. But data oxide works. That's what I know. And ivermectin works, you know. So I don't know about albendazole or the other tinnitus or the other medications is very difficult for me to say. And, and just to add a comment here, um, it was Kelly who started this uh, discussion of ivermectin when they used ivermectin with the uh, in vitro cells that were infected with COVID. Then they postulated a mechanism. Since then, there have been many mechanisms. Actually, there is a uh, doctor, Dr. Pia Dagni and Dr. Asiya Zadi from uh, India who just published a paper with, I think, more than 20 mechanisms of actions. So there is a lot more in the molecule that is useful than just being uh, anti-parasitic. So, uh, Sad, thank you very much for your time. I want to switch now towards long haul. So it was fascinating for me to hear that you said you have seen less long haul patients. I have a similar observation that if early treatment is done and aggressive treatment is done, patients usually do not become long haulers. But sometimes doctors do not approach it that way and the patients become long haulers. So the question, if a patient is a long hauler, how do you manage them? What is your approach? If a patient is a long hauler, uh, one or two patients we had, the most important symptoms is depression in Bangladesh. Depression and weakness, that's what they have. They lost interest. They don't want to move. They have joint pain and the weakness that that is the main problem in a few patients one or two patients i had who have been suffering from tachycardia so the tachycardia patients uh it's easier to, it was easier to treat them because we had give them uh ibabradin and for two months and that slowly decreased the heart rate and they became normal the patients who were depressed we had we had i had good results with uh, acetylopram i didn't use uh Fluoxamine. Acetylopram gave me good results for three months and they usually came out of it. And the patients who had weakness and arthritis, uh, because we had a lot of chikungunya in Bangladesh. So those patients we had to treat. So low dose steroids really helped for a few weeks. Very low dose, 0.5 to 1 milligram of orodexin daily uh, and slowly tapering it with a lot of calcium and vitamin D. Those patients came out of it. So in two, three months, patients were okay. And they went back to their work. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, one uh, symptom set that I'm seeing a lot with the long hauler is the 
disturbance with vision, tinnitus, and brain fog. How do you approach these? I, I haven't seen any patient with brain fog, actually. But uh, depression was there. But my notion is if you have brain fog, uh, uh, ginseng would really help. I, I would prefer to go for ginseng, maybe uh, in a double dose. That that will really help the brain fog. And uh, still, from, I have seen good results. Within two weeks, patients came out of depression and they were thinking like, but uh, I haven't seen brain fog, Dr. Modi. Got it. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to just look at a couple of questions here as well before we go to the post vaccine. Uh, there's a question from Jack. Have you and Dr. Tarek Alam dealt with learners who experience short breath and how are you treating them? Uh, long haulers with uh, shortness of breath. We have a few patients uh, who had 80% lung damage but didn't need to go to the ICU. We got them out from the cabins. They went home. And these patients, usually, I have been giving antifibrotic medications, pyrfenidone. Pyrfenidone has, uh, in the usual dose, like 800 milligrams three times a day, uh, worked wonders. And after two, three months, the lungs become totally clear. So the CT scans became clear, and the patient's shortness of breath disappeared. Pitfinidone, and sometimes if pitfinidone was causing liver problem, I we have a medication here. I don't know whether I don't remember U.S. having it. Uh, there is a uh, medication, chymotrypsinogen, an oral form. Chymotrypsinogen, uh, gynecologists usually use it in patients who have P PID. So this enzyme with the low dose of uh, pitfinidone, one tablet three times a day, uh, really worked wonders here. And the patients got better with that also, and the shortness of it, everything improved. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, Ray says, Ray Kinney says, if long hauler pain, lethargy, weakness, keep people from moving enough, is it important to try to move anyway to circulate lymph? So there are a couple of, uh, just to add to this question, there are some doctors who say, hey, do not do rigorous exercises. And there are people who are bound. So the question is, should they start moving around or should, should they rest? What is the right approach? I think the right approach is to have a passive physical movement or physiotherapy, not too aggressive. They don't have to do it themselves, but at least once or twice somebody helps them to move the limbs to keep the muscles uh, away, keep the muscles uh, limp, and to stay away from stiffness. I think that that should help from the limb, uh, from the limb circulation and everything. Got it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor Amir Hashmi says, and he's a very good doctor as well treatment of covid induced anxiety so if i get covid today i'll become scared and anxious right. do you support do you give something to support that or reduce that anxiety i usually use a very low dose of uh, alprazolam point half tablets of 0.25 milligrams of alpr alprazolam twice a day and that really helps that really helps got it got it one more question from michelle mcdermott she's saying is there any way Verapamil would be helpful against COVID? I don't know, actually. I haven't tried that. Got it. Um, I think you answered this question before. Dr. Amir Hashmi is saying, are, are they using fluvoxamine in COVID? They are using it in Bangladesh. Recently, they have started using flu fluvoxamine in severe COVID patients. A uh, few of the doctors here, and they're using it now, but in a very low dose. Got it. Got it. So um, now if I can switch to the last part of our discussion, and that is the vaccine and post vaccine side effects. So over here, we are seeing a lot that some of the patients or after receiving the vaccine, they develop lingering side effects, for example, tinnitus ringing in the ear or visual disturbance or brain fog or weakness or tachycardia is sim similar to COVID, but some side effects and they continue for months. And it is very difficult. Some of them are refractory to get them out of it. Have you seen after the vaccine side effects? And if so, how do you manage them? Um, 
Vax, after vaccine, most of the patients in Bangladesh actually, we didn't have that many vaccines actually. It was uh, actually uh, distributed all over the country. And whatever we had in Dhaka, in our capital, uh, few patients I have seen that they had joint pain. That's what very common in Bangladesh people. I don't know why. Lots of people had joint pain and body ache. And just today I saw a patient who have who has severe allergic reaction and itching and swelling of both legs so after seven days of the second shot, not after the first shot. And this is uh, she's having this for the last uh, two and a half months. So she have been she has been gone uh, visiting many dermatitis and uh, dermatologists, and uh, they have been treating her as a dermatitis case. But uh, today, when I saw her, that she was really suffering. And I, I actually gave her ivermectin today. Ivermectin, uh, again, for five days, 12 milligrams for five days, and a very low dose of steroid and antihistamines. And most likely in the two, three days, I'll know what happened to her. And if I know that, I'll let that Professor Samina Choudhury and she will let you know what's happening. But other patients who are having this problem of uh, post in Bangladesh, we are having post vaccination COVID infection, a lot of COVID infection. Two months uh, last uh, after the last shot in April, I, we have already seen around 30% of people are having infection by the Delta variant. So this is very common in Bangladesh rather than the vaccination related allergy or uh, reactions. So that's what's happening. And few patients have 60 to 80% of lung involvement, though they say we are not, they're not going to have that much of involvement, but they are having it. Got it. Thank you very much. And uh, while speaking with you, um, it is very evident to me how competent and how caring you are. And your students and your college should be proud of you. Bangladesh should be proud of you because you started this uh, early aggressive treatment, not only started it, but also proposed how should the treatment be. And that is helping uh, all of us in the whole world. So once again, thank you very much for your work. Uh, Dr. Samina Choudhury says, Dr. Alam, my salam to you. Do you think who are not getting vaccination now, they should continue ivermectin every 10th day? Yes, uh, that's what I think. As a temporary prophylaxis, till we get vaccinated, we should take it. We should take it. I have, I have, I myself have not been vaccinated yet. Me and my family. So, but I go see the patient, but I am having ivermectin for the last one and a half years. Uh, I just tested my IgM this morning and an IgG and still negative. So it's surprising. Uh, I don't know. I have to test other people also, but very difficult to say how ivermectin helps. Very interesting. So you've been using it for more than a year. Any side effects that you uh, felt? No, 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 no side effects. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, Jack says, are you using dexamethasone for long haulers? Yes, if they have shortness of breath, if the lungs are affected and the saturation stays around 90 to 93 uh, after getting uh, being negative, I, I am using very low dose, one to two milligrams of dexamethasone for two to three weeks. Got it. Dizzy Logic says, for someone having long term side effects after the first shot of a vaccine, should they take the second shot? Uh, that's a million dollar question, but I think they will have to take a second shot. Maybe not this vaccine, maybe the other vaccine if they get, maybe not the messenger If it's a problem with the messenger RNA, they will they get the adenovirus vaccine. If it's with the adenovirus, they will take the messenger RNA. Otherwise, they will be shut off in the future. They have they will not be able to move, so they have to complete their vaccination. So I think they'll have to take it. Got it. Thank you. Bobo says, can someone who has got adenovirus vector vaccine as a first dose get messenger RNA vaccine as a second dose if they already have arrhythmia, premature atrial contraction and heart palpitation? So can they mix the vaccine if they are scared of the cardiac out outcomes from adenovirus based vaccine? I mean, uh, it's difficult for me to answer because I'm not an authority on the vaccine, but uh, I think they'll need a special uh, opinion from a cardiologist before they go for that, if they're uh, afraid of and, these things. And that's a very important point. And in addition to that, Bobo, um, the study that was done in the UK of mixing and matching vaccines, they specifically wanted to understand after adenovirus-based vaccine, 
can we switch people to messenger RNA to prevent the chances of clotting in spe specifically women under 50? And they found out that the immunity produced was good. However, side effects were slightly more than the same vaccine as a second dose. So, um, Matt Fax says, have you considered giving kudzu instead of ginseng? And yes. I have no idea what kudzu is. So. I have no idea also. And uh, it's not available in Bangladesh also. You might I try see. it there. I see. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I had no idea what that drug is. But thank you for the question. Um, Eric Dog says, ivermectin for heart worms in dogs can be used for the life of dog 10 years. Can this work for humans as well? I think he's talking about long time usage of ivermectin. I mean, they have been giving ivermectin to uh, the people around the Nile, uh, around the Nile who have uh, river blindness for the last uh, 10, 15 years. Over 9 billion people have been having it yearly or six monthly. I think it, been, it can, people can take it for more than 10 years. Got it. Thank you. John Q Public says, if you have had COVID, but now show no antibodies. Just you said that you've been treating patients for a long time. You do not have antibodies. So mm -hmm. don't know if you may have had it or not. What right. would be an alternative test to ask for to prove COVID recovery? Difficult question. So I if, if you allow me, help me. If, if, <laughs> if you allow me, uh, in the US, they have approved a test called T-Detect which looks at the memory T cells. And that is what they can detect and say, yes, you were, uh, you had the infection and now infection. you have recovered. Correct. So T detect test may be doable. Okay. So DI, DIY grandma farmer says, can you tell me what lab tests should confirm long haul COVID if molecular and antibody tests were negative? So is there some specific test you do to figure out who is a long hauler? No, no not in Bangladesh. We don't do that, actually. And we don't have that Got opportunity to do also. And at DIY, for the US, there is a company called Incel DX. Dr. Bruce Patterson has been on my show a, quite a few number of times. Dr. Yo is associated with him as well. Incel DX has created a test. I think it is expensive. I think it's not covered by all insurances at this time, but still they have a formula and I have no interest with them, no commercial interest with them at all. But if you ask for something specific towards long COVID, that is a test that they've been using. So with this, let's see if we answer of questions. There's a question from James Nguyen estimation of how many COVID patients he has treated. So that's a good question. <laughs> Would you like to tell us should how many be, patients you and colleagues may have treated? Yes, should be around should be around uh, around 500 patients since last March. Very good. So um, let's see if we can take one more question. Um, and then So Angelina is saying, and we'll take this as the last question. Dr. Alam used ivermectin every 10 days as a prophylactic for a year and a half. Did I understand that right? No, 10 milligrams, uh, 12 milligrams every 10 days for the last three months. And before that, it was 12 milligrams every 15 days. And if I had a suspicion that I have been exposed to a patient who had removed their mask in my room, I would take an extra dose of six milligrams on that night. Got it. So, sir, with this, thank you so much for being with us. You are Welcome, the point here. So, so for my uh, poor beans, this is, this is a matter of utmost respect and honor for us that you are with us. Thank you very much. And uh, Welcome, thank sir. you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the cool beans. And thanks to Mr. Samin also. Yes. And thank you for your help for humanity by trying ivermectin and then now we are all doing it. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, sir. Anytime. And Kulbin, thank you very much for being here. I would see you all at 6 p.m. today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, sir.